Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissinger. And this is a show for you if you're bored of people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our fantastic expert guest this week is the former Deputy Mayor of London for Education and Culture, who now works in the arts, Munira Mirza. Welcome to Trigonometry. Hi, thank you. It's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we met at the Battle of Ideas and we'll get into talking about some of the stuff you were talking there. But before we get into the show itself, tell us a little bit about who you are, how are you where you are, what's been your story through life and how if there's maybe something that's influenced the beliefs and views you now have, tell us a little bit about that as well. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, I, uh, I grew up in a town called Oldham in the northwest of England. Splendid area. And very nice area. <laughs> um, and um, my, by, my parents uh, are immigrants from Pakistan, or they, they came over from Pakistan. And uh, you know, I guess it was a you know, fairly ordinary upbringing. I went to a comprehensive school. Um, and in many ways, you know, my family is an immigrant success story. We went to university. I was very lucky I got to Oxford. I was quite an academic student and um, I think when I was at Oxford and then since I became interested in politics I met people from different backgrounds left and right and I became particularly interested in the relationship between culture and politics and I studied English literature I was interested in the arts and I've always I suppose been curious about how culture defines us and reflects our values what we think of society what it means to be human and Conversely, how our values and ideas shape the arts and shape the culture that we produce. So I've always been interested in how our identities are shaped by um, the culture around us. Um, in terms of my politics, I suppose I started off, um, I would have called myself left wing, although over the years I found that my arguments with people tend to be stronger with people on the left. Um, and maybe that's because the world has, has changed a great deal. Um, but I've, I, I guess I've always been suspicious of consensus and norms mm. and wanted to question what I see as orthodoxies around certain things. And, and in my 20s, I became particularly interested in the discussions around multiculturalism. And quite early on uh, in the 2000s, I started writing critically about multiculturalism. Uh, back before it was really, I think, um, being debated a lot, I, you know, I wrote a series of essays and articles challenging what I thought was uh, in some ways, a, a kind of ideology that was meant to be about equity and fairness and liberating people from oppression. And what has become, I think, quite a rigid and oppressive ideology in many ways, which has tended to box people into categories. Mm. And I've always been worried, and maybe I am partly influenced by my own background. I'm, you know, I'm from an ethnic minority background, but I've never felt that I am just defined by that. But I think that increasingly, we tend to think of people as being defined by these characteristics and almost assuming that some of them are good, inherently good, and some of them are inherently bad. Mm. And we tend to make judgments which are prejudicial uh, and not, not really fair, not really seeing people as individuals. And yeah. to me, whatever was progressive and positive about multiculturalism, a large part of that has evolved into something which I think is holding people back. And, and I've always thought that that was very counterproductive for ethnic minorities. It's not a, you know, it's not a popular mainstream view. I think, yeah, more, and more, <laughs> I think more and more people are challenging it. But, yeah. um, and you know, we can talk about that. I, I know now quite a lot of ethnic minority people who sympathize and who agree mm. that something that was meant to be in their interest is actually starting to work against them and working against you know, proper relationships in society, really harmonious relationships, is becoming quite divisive. Well, a lot of our viewers are of that, actually, when we went to the battle of ideas where we met, as mm. I said, there were loads of people coming up to us. And I'll be honest with you, deep down inside, I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting you to be from this background, you know, even though it makes perfect sense. And people from different backgrounds, they don't have a monolithic way of thinking. Mm. Um, but you talk about multiculturalism, and uh, it's interesting that we actually don't talk about it anymore. It's almost like we've kind of accepted that the, the Merkel and David Cameron both came out and said that it's not working, and kind of we've moved on to something else, which is identity politics now. Mm. It's kind of morphed into this thing, isn't it? Yeah, essentially, I, I see them as similar things. They're different words mm. for a similar trend. Mm. So even if the language has changed because the language has stopped mm. being fashionable or 
you know, politicians like Cameron and Merkel have recognised that there's a, a kind of a groundswell against some of these ideas. They still continue, they're, they're perpetuated, but they come in different words and different languages. So you've now got concepts like white privilege and, um, you know, identity politics and protected characteristics. And this is the new, the evolution of the same, the same kind of approach. Um, and I'm always clear when I talk about multiculturalism, I'm not against a multi-ethnic society. I mean, we live in a multi-ethnic society. There are people with differences. Mm. I come from a background which is obviously ethnically different to the mainstream majority in this country. And I don't want to live in a society where there is intolerance. I want to be somewhere where we recognize that people have differences. And, and that's part of what it is to live in a kind of cosmopolitan place, particularly in somewhere like London, where I live now. Um, but I think the idea that our differences define us, that they should be things that determine policy, that we should uh, treat people differently because of those cultural differences, I think that can lead us into all sorts of dead ends and it can be quite divisive. It ends up, I think, making something which you know, is a fact in society, we are different, but it makes it much more rigid, makes it much more um, difficult for people to transcend those identities. You know, I, I am an Asian woman from the North, I have a working class background, but there are lots of things about me which cannot be contained by that, that, that you know, different. And, um, I, I, and I suppose, again, you know, going back to my own background, I never thought when I was growing up that I only wanted to read, read writers who were Asian women from working class <laughs> backgrounds. And, you know, the things that, that I was interested in. That might be a bit of a limited <laughs> reading pool there. Exactly, honest, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are great writers who, you know, yeah. are, are that, yeah. but... Um, you know, I, I, I sort of subscribe to the, 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 the sort of famous line by the, the Roman playwright Terence, nothing human is alien to me. And I think the idea that, well, you know, we are human, we can empathise with each other through culture, through the arts, that that's one of the great things about the arts and um, uh, you know, the things that I'm drawn to. When you read a book, you're seeing the world through somebody else's eyes. Mm. And that ability to transcend, that universal impulse, I think, is a very powerful one. And we've become, I think, as a society in the arts and in academia, we've become quite sceptical about that idea that there is such a thing as great art that everyone can enjoy and, re and relate to. It's that seen as... Um, you know, the sort of thing that they would have said in the past, very old-fashioned notion that's for dead white men, really. <laughs> yeah. um, and really what we need now is to uh, teach young ethnic minority people about their culture. They need to see themselves reflected in the art that, that's in the galleries or in the books that they read in school. And I just think it's very limiting. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure that I'm not the only person who feels that way. And you, you speak to artists, actually, and they're sometimes the most um, worried about this kind of categorising you know, the way that often funding works in the arts, you know, I've seen it, that there's a sort of a designer, you know, we've got, to, we've got to have more BME people in the arts, but then that becomes quite limiting because you end up ghettoizing black artists and mm. saying, well, we're giving money out for people who are creating art that's, that, you know, that's about diversity. And, and they're saying, well, you know, we're artists first and foremost. And the kinds of subjects we're interested in might be science, they might be, you know, climate change, it might be anything. And why do you assume that the thing I'm obsessed about is my identity? But, but we do that all the time, we perpetuate that. And do you think it is, as a trend, it's getting worse? And because to me, and I mean, I, I used to be a drama teacher, I'm in comedy, it seems to me that we're progressing ever more down this path where it seems to be, oh, you know, we're, this person is getting this opportunity, not because of the art that they create, but because they go, oh, because they are X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 therefore they are here. And you just think, but surely we should just be judging the art. Ultimately, isn't where the artist is from irrelevant? Because when you go and look at a Michelangelo, you, you, it doesn't really matter that apparently... Dead white man, though, yeah. isn't he? Dead white man. Dead white gay man, so, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. the, the gay doesn't count anymore, man. OK, fair enough. Right, um, so we've lost our six gay <laughs> <laughs> audience members. But, but it, it, in many ways, it doesn't matter who the artist is. It, what matters is the art, surely. Well, yeah, I mean, I think... It, what I would say is for a lot of artists, their identity is part, might be part of the art that they make. And that's perfectly fine. You know, it's hard to imagine someone like um, you know, Benjamin Zephaniah. Mm. You know, his, his background, his cultural background, his experiences are part of the, the poetry that he writes. And that's mm. fine. But I think at the end of the day, when you're, you know, when you're making judgments, you're judging the quality of that work and how well he communicates that experience. And there's something about that which is more than just he ticks a box. And it's patronising to someone like him to say, well, the reason that he's 
considered a you know a great poet and you know significant is because he takes the box. It's because he's telling us something about the human experience, and he's he's bringing a different perspective. So um, I think you're right that we we've forgotten in a way that the artist, the individual artist, is bringing all their personal experience to bear, and that that can be very wide ranging. It's not just about their ethnic experience, although that might be part of it. It's, it's lots of things. And, and in fact, the one thing we don't talk about in, in the arts as much in terms of diversity is political diversity. And certainly class diversity is an issue, although that's yeah. more of a conversation now. Um, but, but people do bring bit different perspectives. And, and we shouldn't sort of pretend that we're all atomized individuals that don't have shared experiences or shared cultural identities. It's just if, we, if we're starting to judge that as more important than other things, then, then we get into trouble. Um, I, probably, I don't know if I've explained that well enough. It's, I'm trying not to say culture is irrelevant, ethnicity mm. is irrelevant, because I think it matters to a lot of people. We're just going to clip that bit and make <laughs> it go viral. <laughs> Carefully edit me down. Culture is irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> ethnicity is irrelevant, bam, there you go, off into the internet. No, well, I know exactly what you're saying. I, I think the, the thing between the two of you is basically you're saying culture and ethnicity can be important, but what he's saying is that shouldn't be the basis on which we evaluate. Yeah. Exactly. Who yeah. should be advanced, promoted, etc. Yeah. yeah, and and you know sometimes it, it you know sometimes it can be as crude as that. You know, and I've I've you know I won't name names, but I've been involved in meetings and conversations and organisations where you know they think oh god well you know we, we need to increase the the proportion we need to increase the target, and they're responding to a very real pressure because there you know there are that many by comparison, ethnic minorities in the art sector or in parts of academia or in the media and publishing. Um, and there are, there are reasons for that. There are long-standing reasons. I don't think it's about racism as it happens in the way that is commonly mm. described. Um, I think there is a reason why you know, people from poorer backgrounds tend to not go into insecure employment mm -hmm. in the cultural sector. You know, there's, you know, these are not as, you know, jobs that um, uh, you know, a lot of families will aspire for their children to go into because mm. they would worry about, you know. So, so we could talk about low pay in the arts or in publishing. Or in comedy. Work Let's talk or, about low pay yeah, in comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, yeah, yeah. the deprived comedians of, yes. of the country. Um, but, but, you know, to have a meaningful conversation, we have to get away from this idea that they're not getting in because they're black and therefore we have to correct yeah. that. Well, let's talk about this because I think one of the most impressive interviews I've ever seen uh, online of you, and has very few views actually, I noticed. So go and watch this interview <laughs> that I'm about to talk about, is you talking to the BBC about the government's race audit, mm. where essentially what they found was that certain ethnic minorities were not very doing very well in certain areas. Incidentally, one of the things they didn't really raise is that certain ethnic minorities are doing incredibly well mm. in certain mm. areas. And, for example, white working class boys are doing incredibly badly in the education. The worst, in fact. In education, right? Uh, but anyway, they, they, were, they were asking you what you thought about this, and, mm. and, and it was all kind of served with the source of racism and discrimination. Any disparity... Lovely between, tasting sauce, by yeah, the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mate, you've got to be careful with your voice, I keep telling <laughs> yeah. you. Francis has got a really racist-sounding voice. Uh, like, <laughs> it's a voice of an angry white man. <laughs> yeah, gammon voice. I, I won't say anything. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, and you were kind of trying to explain to them this very simple concept, which is that not all disparities in outcome mm. re reference actual discrimination or mm. racism. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, can you tell us, for, for anyone who wasn't uh, aware of it, what that race order was mm, and, mm. and what kind of what you think about it? Yeah, uh, the, the government announced, or Theresa May announced when she became prime minister, that she was going to tackle burning injustices in society. And one of the... Uh, announcement she made was that the government would run something called a racial disparities audit. So it would look at how different ethnic groups fare in British society, in the public services, so the NHS, in health, in education, but also in areas like employment um, uh, uh, and uh, other kinds of you know, discrimination, policing, criminal justice system and so on. And um, the report was published last year, or the a website um, was launched that, that showed these statistics. And interestingly, the, the audit revealed that the picture is very complex. It's, it's not clear cut that white people always do better and ethnic minorities always do worse. In fact, there are some areas where ethnic minorities are doing really well. Um, so if you look at the NHS, for instance, about a third of doctors in the NHS are BME, uh, the non-white, or a third of 
senior consultants in the NHS are non-white. So um, there are some areas where actually there's a real success story, there's something to celebrate. But when the audit was published, all the emphasis from government and from the media was on the negatives, where ethnic minorities are not doing well. And it perpetuated what I thought was a very negative, um, uh, inaccurate picture, really, of British society. You know, it, it, it reinforces this idea that ethnic minorities are being systematically oppressed, that there's a kind of institutional problem. Um, when, in fact, what we've seen in the last 20 years is a kind of liberalisation and opening up for many people. And my, my worry has always been that when you tell that negative story, it both, you know, it, it skewers policy. It means that people make bad policy decisions because they think they're trying to correct something that's actually working quite well. Mm. But it also reinforces for a lot of younger people this idea that they can't succeed. Mm. And that, I think, can have quite a big material impact. It can mean that they're not motivated to go out, apply to university, go and be ambitious, seek good jobs, because they'll think that they've always got... Uh, a kind of white, racist uh, decision maker who's holding them back. And I, th I think that can create a lot of tension and division in the society. If you're constantly telling people uh, um, from ethnic backgrounds that, that this society is against you, that's not going to be great for uh, engendering harmonious social relations. Mm. You know, they're going to be resentful. Well, you've it. made the point even further, actually, that, for example, a black defendant who's suspicious about his lawyer is more likely to make a bad decision, for example, to plead innocent when, in fact, they should plead guilty. And mm. as a result of that, you end up w with young black men getting harsher sentences yeah. because they don't trust the system and they don't do the, what they ought to do kind of in a percentage place situation. Yeah, and so the, and this, you know, the criminal justice system report, which was authored by uh, or led by David Lammy mm. MP, uh, showed that there, there was this disparity. I mean, in many other areas, in many other parts of the criminal justice system, the, the disparity between ethnic groups can be explained by a number of different factors. The fact that there are, you know, proportionally a higher number of black men in, um, uh, in the criminal justice system uh, is, is, you know, there are reasons for that. You know, there are higher proportions of arrests, you know, the, the, you know, the uh, you know, you can go into the detail of that. But there was one disparity which was interesting in that report, which is why is it that um, black men are more likely to receive harsh sentencing? And they found, interestingly, as you say, that, that they were uh, not pleading guilty because they didn't trust the advice of their solicitors and they didn't trust the system. And that's, a, I, th I would argue, is partly a result of not completely, but it's partly a result of their fear that the system is going to be prejudiced against them. So it has this really counterproductive effect. It's, you know, damaging to their life chances, really. And the same thing's happened in other areas like mental health, for instance, where um, we know that there's been a huge amount of debate and discussion about whether the institutional, there's institutional racism in the mental health system because a higher proportion of ethnic minorities are likely to appear in the system and to be detained, forcibly detained. Which is obviously worrying when you look at the statistics and think, well, why is it? You know, are they more likely to have mental illness? Yes, they are actually. You know, there's lots of good research to show that they're, for all sorts of reasons, they have higher risk factors. But also what, they, what researchers have found is that uh, a lot of people from ethnic groups are worried about how the system is going to treat them. So they don't report until it's almost too late, until their, their condition has worsened to a point where they may end up being violent to themselves or other people. And at that point, they need to be forcibly detained. At that point, the police get involved. And, and, and you have a very different... The system has to react differently to you. So it, I, the thing that frustrates me is that people use these statistics almost with a political agenda to try and prove a point about systematic racism. But the effect of that is even more damaging. And if we were more honest, if we were looking at the statistics more dispassionately, he would see that it's just a, a really complex picture. And, and I, I think ethnic minorities are you know, the, the ones who suffer the most often, you know, because no one's really thinking about their interests as, you know, as individuals in the system. They're just thinking, how can we make a political point? How can we show that we're virtuous? You know, I think in the, in, the, in the case of the government, I think the government was trying very hard to show that it wasn't the nasty party anymore, and that you know, they, they care about these vulnerable groups. But in doing that, they, you know, they, they have perpetuated a lot of these 
uh, per perceptions and this very negative story. Francis, can gonna... you say something really loud to Mars? I was going to say, this <laughs> is going to... a helicopter that's just decided... See, we keep telling you a trigonometry that no one wants us to be having these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fucking helicopter hovering above us. In the, uh, in the... By the way, we forgot to explain at the beginning of the interview that uh, we're on location, as we told you last week. Um, and we're one of what, our big fans is... Is it quite literally just above us? Yeah. yeah, there's a helicopter hovering above us, just recording everything and reporting us to the police for a hate crime. <laughs> there we are. Yeah. We're gonna put I think we're going to have to make a run for it. Yeah, 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 we, yeah. We, are, yeah. we are actually going to have to leave. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as, as the, as the uh, white man, I am going to get off scot-free, so see you all later, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. no, typical. Uh, typical, exactly. But there's one thing that we didn't cover. When we look at these stats, and I, as a former teacher, I do find it incredibly interesting, um, is work, white working-class boys all, always at the bottom when it comes to stats. And I sometimes think that if it had been, you know, working class black boys, working class Asian boys, there would be a massive outcry about it, rightly so. But because it's working class white boys, we tend just to shrug our shoulders and go, oh well, what can you do? Let's crack on. And they do tend to be forgotten almost. Yeah, I think, I think that has changed actually. I mean, in the last few years, there's been more awareness of the fact that uh, it's not just it's not it's not just a racial thing, and, yeah. and and what we don't want to get into is this idea that somehow white working class boys are being failed because of their whiteness mm -hmm. either. Yeah, you know, there there are problems with our education system. I, I actually I think what's happening is that a lot of immigrant families are correcting and are intervening and are. Uh, you know, getting their kids to go to private tutors to correct for faults in the system. Hmm. And, um, you know, it's not unusual if you're going, you know, if you're driving around South London, um, you will see in shop windows adverts for maths and English tuition um, for immigrant groups. You know, there are Saturday schools. There's a very strong culture of supplementary schools in the Afro-Caribbean community, for instance. These are all to try and correct for what they perceive to be problems in the education system. And that hasn't been the case for a lot of white working class mm. communities. Um, but yeah, you know, we have to, I think we should focus our education system on, you know, supporting the people who are struggling, whatever their ethnic background. And to, for too long, we've racialized a lot of these problems. This is the point, Manera, is like uh, what Francis' question reveals and your answer is that we, we, we think in terms of race all the time now. Mm. And this way of thinking encourages white people to think about, well, well, if you're talking about these ethnic minorities, what about us? We're victimized in this area mm, or that mm. area. And it's just like, and even if you don't agree with it, as I don't, like I was driving home the other day and there was a girl waiting to cross the road. And it was like one of those choice situations I could have driven or I could have let her pass. And I swear to God, I looked at her and she was black and I went, oh, she's black, I've got to let her through. You know, this is how we start to think. Mm. And it's crazy, isn't it? This is absolutely mental that we've, we've been encouraged to think in this way. Well done for not being racist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, even laughing about it. <laughs> yeah, at all. Um, yeah I, th I think people change their behavior and um, they're, they're on guard. There's a sort of sensitivity about mm. it. And it, in a, the, 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 the end result is that you end up treating people differently because they're race and they know it. Yeah. So um, uh, I remember, um, I think I may have said it even at the Battle of Ideas session that I was at, that um, there was one writer, um, I won't name her, she wrote a blog, um, who complained that white people would come up to her and say how articulate she was. And she felt that this was an insult because really they weren't expecting her to be articulate because she's a black female. And I thought, you know, even when, when compliments are treated as some kind of you know, expression of racism, mm. you know, we're, there's literally nothing you can do, everything you say. And it could be that they just thought she genuinely was articulate and mm. they were congratulating her for it. But people then become very defensive and afraid. Um, I, I remember reading a report um, a long time ago. It was, uh, I think it was in the, it was a, a, a report of the Met Police. It must have been about 10 years ago. And they noted that, um, that black police officers were more likely to be formally disciplined than white police officers in the Met. And there was a discussion in the paper about, you know, what was the driver behind this? And it turns out one of the reasons was because their superiors were so worried about having informal conversations with them mm. about problems that they felt they had to go through the formal means. And that's what happens. We don't trust our instincts. We don't trust how people will perceive that we don't think that they will give us the benefit of the doubt. So we do everything in a much more formally, formally regulated way. So in the workplace, 
people are afraid of interacting with their colleagues in a particular way. Mm. You know, the, a word said incorrectly or a slightly insensitive remark, you know, where do you come from, uh, that kind of thing, is now regarded as racism could get you discipline, mm. you could end up in a racial grievance situation. You know, the, the workplace is, a, you know, essentially it's still a workplace. You know, you have a boss, they, they have the power to sack you. So the kind of informal social relationships that you need to be healthy in order for a civic society to be strong are being weakened by you know people's you know kind of desperation to jump onto anything as being potentially offensive um and and often people self-censor which you know it's, it's terrible you can't you can't have warm human contact with people you know proper social interaction if you're constantly worrying that they're going to be upset by what you say you made the great point, just one final thing yeah. on this, Francis. Uh, you told a story about your dad's colleague. Mm. Uh, to tell us that, because I, I thought it was such a great story about the power of interpreting things in different ways. Yeah. Like, do you interpret something as an offence or mm. do you interpret something as, as, a, you know, as a way to connect, as an yeah. attempt to connect? Yeah, my, my dad worked in a car parts factory for about 20 years of his, um, at the end of his working life. And... Um, a lot of his colleagues were white working class Oldhamers and every year um, one of them called Tom would ring up on Christmas Day and wish, you know, wish him and the family happy Christmas. And, you know, he knew that we were a Muslim family, but you know, he rang up because it, it was the nice thing to do. You know, he wanted to make an effort. And, um, and even when my, my dad passed away, he would ring up you know, um, in the years that followed um, and just, just to say that. And it, it, the way that I interpreted it, it was, a, it was a very kind gesture and he wanted my dad to feel welcome. You know. We were an Asian family in Oldham. And it, to me, it, you know, it felt like a kind thing to do, a very human thing to do. Whereas now, you know, you think about it and you listen to so-called anti-racists talking about white privilege. And they would say, well, you know, it was a bit insensitive to ring up a Muslim family and wish them happy Christmas. And you can imagine that a comment like that would be regarded as insensitive rather than, you know, a humane and kind thing to do. Mm. And that's the sort of madness that we're in, that that people's intentions are misinterpreted, willfully misinterpreted often. And I think that something is going on in anti-racism today where um, uh, I think there is a, a kind of, um, as well as a political agenda, I think there's a sort of, um, a, you know, really kind of almost corrupt tendency among some people to see a, a, a problem, to see a system um, in, a, in a negative light because it gives them something to have a grievance about. Mm. And there is a currency to victim culture. I'm not saying that people aren't victims. You know, you can be a victim of racism in this country today. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I personally experienced racism. It's, just, it's not a nice thing. Mm. I think um, on balance, I've been fortunate enough that the vast majority of my interactions with white people have not been racist yeah. ones. You know, they've been good uh, ones. This and, you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, apart from the, you know, the casual racists here on my left, it's been broadly... Yeah. Um, it's been casual because I'm not smart. Uh, you know. uh, but, no, no. you know, joking aside, it is a serious thing. It's a horrible course, thing when it yeah, happens. Of course. And, um, you know, I... I'm, my family have personal experience of that, so... Well, so do I, yeah. looking the way I look in Russia, and actually in this country as well. You know, uh, but the question always for me, my, my parents were always very clear with me that those are just stupid people. They're not representative of a group of people or of society. Someone being racist to you isn't representative of that group of people, it, just in the same way that you are not representative of the group of people that you come from. You're just yeah. an individual, right? Yeah, and, and, and I think something has changed in the last sort of 30 years. When I was growing up, there was more racism. Mm. Um, even, you know, even then it wasn't as, you know, as um, dramatic as it was 20 years before that. You know, Britain was a more racist society in the 50s and 60s, and you would see people being much more offensive. But th I think the difference was that it was a, a, it was a broader social phenomenon and it was more acceptable. And you could get away with saying things which were deeply offensive. Mm. And, you know, there were people in senior positions of authority who could say things. But something changed in the 70s and 80s, and some of that has to do with anti-racism campaigning mm. and people on the left and progressives as well. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, a lot of credit should be given to them. But also there was a liberalisation more generally in society, in the workplace, and I think, you know, the, ironically, the, the sort of the, the changing... Um, workplace relations with regards to unionisation meant that a lot of those jobs that would have been in a more kind of closed way past 
you know, from father to son or communities, those opened up. So more ethnic minorities had the chance of getting those jobs. Mm. I think the kinds of industries and jobs that have opened up in the last 20 years in areas like law, finance, accountancy, they are more open and poorer. So you don't have to have known someone in that family to go and get a job in a, in a bank. Um, if you think about some of the bigger um, uh, industries like the printing industry around Fleet Street, they were very white, male dominated. It was not an easy place to get into. And that has changed a lot. And with that has come the, you know, the hollowing out of a lot of working class white communities. And that has had a, you know, has had a negative effect on them. But it, it's meant, you know, we've opened up as a society, we are less racist. But it's almost like anti-racists don't really recognise that anything's changed. Mm. And you'll hear people, and there are academics, people like Kahindi Andrews or writers like Afwa Hirsch or Renier Dolod, who try and uh, argue that, you know, racism is still there, it's just more polite. And, you know, people's prejudices are hidden, but really they, you know, they don't want your children to, you know, they don't want um, their children to marry someone from a different ethnic background. I mean, if you look at all the surveys, that's, that's completely untrue. Racial prejudice has declined. You know, people are far more accepting and willing to have an ethnic minority boss or uh, a, a person marrying their son or daughter from an ethnic minority background. You know, there is, I would say that um, with, with Muslims and Islam, there is more of a prejudice. Mm. And that is different, that's an outlier. But in these other areas, um, that, that seems to... Actually, the, the thing that hasn't um, gone down, it's probably gone up, is inter-ethnic tension which we never talk about in this country. You know, the fact that there is tension between Asians and blacks in some parts of the country, um, that there's a lot of prejudice amongst those groups, both against whites, but against you know, each other. Um, that, that's, you know, that's almost ignored because the narrative we have now is white versus black. It's, it's fascinating that you talk about that. I used to teach in South London, and what, one thing that I never realised was uh, the tension between some African communities and uh, Caribbean communities. Mm. And the fact they, they, some, they didn't get on, they didn't like each other, there was a tension there, and I'd never really been aware about that. But one thing I wanted to talk about, because the quickest way for me to start an argument with anyone is mention the two words white and privilege. Where do you stand on it, and what, does it exist, first of all? Uh, in your opinion, and if so, how big a factor does it play in the mm. life in the UK? I mean, it, 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 it's such an ahistoric term. It doesn't mean anything, really, anymore. I mean, you could talk about a white privilege in the context of 1950s Alabama, where being white had a material impact on your life compared to being black. You know, you had um, uh, laws that regulated where you could go, what kind of job you, you know, who you could marry, you know, that kind of deep racial divide. Then in that kind of context, white privilege makes absolute sense. Yeah. White but, privilege. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense in that context. Um, to an extent, although, you know, I'd say, you know, everything is more complex. But today, it doesn't make sense. You know, I think about, you know, I mentioned my dad's friend. I'm not quite sure, you know, a white working class guy who works in a factory alongside Asian people, does he really have that much more of a privilege than you know the people that the Asian people that he's working alongside and I don't think that it stands up as a meaningful term well the advantage of the example that people might give for a white privilege where there might be some credibility to is for example two drivers dri uh, doing the same thing on the road right mm. black people would argue a black person is more likely to be pulled over uh, or something like that uh, I mean, the whole stop and search thing is quite an interesting discussion. I've, I've written about it a bit. The, I mean, the, the disparity between um, ethnic groups and the white population in terms of how often they get stopped can, is largely explained by um, uh, what we you know, call presence on the streets, you know, whether they're available to be stopped. So how many people, rather than just looking at the population at large, um, uh, numerically, you know, how many people there are in the population, how many black people is a proportion. You, you're looking instead at how many people are in a particular area on the street at night. So younger people tend to be um, disproportionately searched. Men don't, tend to be disproportionately searched as well. And there are ethnic minorities disproportionately, it's particularly in areas where there are high crime rates. So once you take all those factors into account, the disproportionality comes right down. Mm. Um, 
So I think that argument that, well, it's because they're black or it's white privilege is far too simplistic. Yes, there, as we said before, there are disparities in outcome, but the explanation behind it is, is more complex than, well, a white police officer just sees a, you know, a black person driving a car and stops them because they're black. Mm. Um, and that's, that's the kind of, I think that's a very crude discussion that we're having now about policing, yeah. which is, you know, and, and then, you know, the, the, what that does is it, it means that we are, um, I think, not policing well enough. We're not, you know, we're not uh, 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 looking at crime, particularly in areas like London, um, and, and dealing with some of the consequences um, of knife crime because we're afraid of stop and search, because we're worried about, you know, the police are worried about being regarded as racist or politicians are. And the impact of that is that we're not doing proper policing and that has an impact on the victims of crime who tend to be disproportionately black. So if we were having an honest conversation, it would be about whether, you know, whether um, we need policing to be, you know, targeted in areas of need and whether that means that, you know, this disproportionality is not the most important issue. Is it effective policing? Um, and we could have an interesting argument about how liberal and libertarian we should be, how, you know, when the police should stop, what kind of information they should have. But too often we don't have that honest conversation because of this fear of, of racial dis disparity. And do you think it's almost uh, the way we're talking about it, it's just become a form of censorship, hasn't it, really? Where people will have an opinion, an idea, but they don't dare say it because of the yeah. fear that they're going to get smeared. And doesn't that, that must create resentment, surely, and anger and bitterness, does not Does it not? I yeah, imagine. I mean, there was, a, there was a very interesting report in the Harvard Business Review about diversity training in businesses. And so, you know, the one, the one way in which you don't improve racial relations in business is you introduce diversity training. <laughs> because, you know, because, because white people feel very, very pissed off, really, yeah. that yeah. they get told all the time that they've got white privilege and they have to be more sensitive. Um, and it creates resentment, and, and, and but also it you know it just creates the sense that you, you've got to treat people differently, and it just stops people from thinking for themselves. I think that's that's the thing that has always um, aggravated me about the sort of anti-racism that it's essentially telling people no your instincts, your general instinct to kind of treat everybody equally and the same. There's something wrong with that, mm. and you have to think carefully about before you speak, and it's a form of policing which is not really in the best interest of people. It's, a, it's, a, and it, it's also about shaming people. You know, you're shamed into silence. Um, and even where the statistics are clearly uh, telling a different story, everybody goes along with the narrative that prevails. Um, uh, you know, and I've seen, I've seen statistics, it happens in the arts all the time, where we talk about, you know, unless there are 13% ethnic minorities working in arts organisations, there's, you know, there's a, um, you know, there's systemic racism. You think, well, hang on, that 13% is probably based on the proportion of BME people in the wider population. But half of those people, proportionately, are pe people who were born in another country. So a large number of them will, you know, will have come from a very different background. Mm. We wouldn't expect them to necessarily be running a theatre. But that kind of... <laughs> yeah, you escape from the poverty in Bangladesh to come here and pursue an unpaid career in comedy. It's not likely, yeah, is it? Yeah, some people <laughs> will be, you know, successful and, you know... But it's the idea that you just take a blanket figure yeah. and that will tell you whether there's uh, systemic racism. It's, I mean, it is crazy, but nobody will really challenge it. And you know, most people have got day jobs, they're busy, life's too short. I don't want to be the person in the room that complains about it. I don't want to look like the racist, so I won't say anything. Mm. Um, and I, my view is that the only people, really, who can challenge this, who have a vested interest in challenging it, are ethnic minorities mm. who see that it is not in anyone's interest to perpetuate this. So I, I set up a blog actually, which I'd like to plug. Called oh, All, brilliant, go with, for it. With some friends called All in Britain, allinbritain.org. Mm -hmm. um, and we're a group of writers from different ethnic backgrounds. And we write more critically about identity politics, basically. And um, we try and show that there are different ways of thinking about these issues. Not every black person has to take the you know, kind of progressive anti-racist line. Mm. Um, there are other types of anti-racism. There are other ways of being against racism, which do not have that kind of tinge of grievance and that kind of reveling in victim culture. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, I think there needs to be a genuine plurality or a genuine diversity of views amongst ethnic minorities. And mm. um, I, I think, you know, everyone um, 
lots of people in, in ethnic communities feel ashamed of kind of speaking out because they don't want to be seen as dissing their own group or somehow not being on the side of people in their ethnic background and 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 because well, you're going to get called bounty or yeah. a cow coconut or yeah. whatever yeah, right yeah people are afraid of being you know and you know we know senior ethnic minority politicians have you know use the term uncle tom yeah. Um, yeah and you know you've seen this happening with you know candidates like Sean Bailey who is a conservative candidate he's black and he's being attacked because he dares to go outside you know the 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 left wing consensus mm. and say well I'm I'm not going to define myself in that way um, and that, that's the sort of, I think that's just the very restrictive kind of culture that ethnic minorities face. And it's much more inhibiting than, you know, than white oppression, frankly. In, in many ways, it's, it's very interesting, as, especially you see with, the, with you know, ethnic minorities. And when they come out as being a conservative, it's, a betray, they see, it's almost seen as a betrayal of their people mm. and their culture. I was talking to a black comedian and uh, he was talking and he sort of alluded to the fact that he wasn't left wing and he wasn't on the left. But when he told me we we're in a green room and he actually literally checked over his shoulder mm. and then started the discussion because that's how uncomfortable he felt about it. And you just think that, you know, this it surely isn't that the antithesis of what the left is about. It surely isn't the left about being liberal, liberal, about being accepting of saying, you know, we are different, but we can come together and we can have a society which works and functions. It's not about pointing fingers and demonising people just because they have a different idea politically. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a problem with people disagreeing, even you know, disagreeing very stridently. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what politics is. And I fully expect, you know, I've, I've spent, you know, most of my adult life, you know, having, you know, a minority opinion in a room, you know, yeah. and, um, uh, you know, particularly in the, you know, in the art sector, kind of, you know, typical kind of what you would see as a sort of, Metropolitan liberal elite, I guess, you know, I'm very much part of that. That's my world. Those are my friends and um, And yeah, you know, we disagree, but you're right that the, the thing that is You know, just I, I, find, I you know baffling is that people will talk about Wanting to be open-minded and tolerant and welcome diversity, but political diversity is the one thing that they will not tolerate mm. and um, You know, it's not it's, it, it, it means that you never really challenge your own views you never question um, and, you know, I, I, I know why it's easier for people to live in that way. I know, you know, how hard it is to go against the grain. Mm. Um, but, I, you know, I think society can't progress unless we do have people who are, who are saying, well, you know, I, I think differently about that. And that moves, brings us really nicely on to uh, the, the, the topic that brings everybody together all around the UK, which is Brexit. <laughs> well, before we get on to Brexit, I just wanted to point out how skillfully you weaved in a story about your one black friend. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. He's brilliant. And I would never, ever mention his name. I'm going to do it. I'm going to drop him in and he's going to tweet. Is he real? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's real to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, Brexit, now, uh, we have the stereotypical image of the Brexiteer, which is uh, a you. large, yeah, basically me, in about <laughs> 10 years, uh, getting a bit more bitter and angry, slightly pink around the jowls, waving his finger, talking yeah. about immigrants. Um, yeah. And, however, you are a Brexiteer. Yeah. Yep, I Looks I can am, be deceiving. I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some people like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> on, yeah. Side, yeah. on my side. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not. I don't. I don't think of myself as a particularly angry person. Um, I, um, <laughs> I, but you know, I've, I've been Eurosceptic for a fairly long time. I made my decision. Um, you know, after weighing up the pros and cons, you know, I'm not some kind of you know mad zealot. Um, but I, I just think we are. It's better to leave. I, I would like to have left in a better, more orderly way. Frankly, it's not going, you know, as well as one would hope. But I still think in the long term, it's the right decision. Um, because in the long term, I, you know, for, for reasons I've said publicly in many events that I've spoken at, you know, I think democracy and sovereignty are you know, paramount in a society and um, you know, decisions that are made in a country must be accountable to the people and increasingly so many decisions are no longer accountable. People feel disconnected from decisions about the economy, about law, about immigration and um, what's happened, I think, since the vote, which I think is very interesting, is how much anti-democratic feeling there is and how uninhibited people are mm. about expressing that. 
And I think that's extraordinary, you know, and even, you know, interestingly in the arts, I've, you know, worked in the arts for a long time, how as a sector we really want to engage, and I think it's sincere, we want to include people. We talk about bringing more people into museums, into theatres, you know, discounting tickets, reaching out. And then when the Brexit vote happened, it was almost like the light went off and suddenly for a lot of people, you know, those people are thick, they're not educated, they're, they, they were lied to, they didn't know what they were voting for. Their opinions, their views no longer counted. And I don't think that's the case for all the people who work in the arts. I think there are a lot of people in the middle, like, like you know, many of us. Um, but unfortunately, those voices were very loud and very strident. And they appeared in the newspapers the next day. Mm. And it, I think, you know, the one thing this referendum has done is it's revealed that anti-democratic sensibility. And I'm glad, I'm glad it has, because I think we have to confront that as a society and what that means. And, um, you know, I'm, and I'm, you know, I think it's outrageous the way that, you know, people were talking about, you know, working class people, older people, people in the north as if they were subhuman. Mm. You know, it was almost like we were in the Victorian era and we were saying essentially these people shouldn't be allowed the vote because they didn't know what they were voting for. And we know what's in their best interests because we have all the facts. Um, I thought it was incredibly patronising, and you know, I'm I'm glad that came out because you know we have to see it for what it is and challenge it. It's amazing this attitude. Look, I, both of Francis and I voted Remain, but because we're good people. <laughs> Not again. He keeps doing that fucking joke, and every time he does, we get like two hundred. Oh, you're both really. Yeah, you prick, you smug Remain. <laughs> I'm going to do it every single time. <laughs> he just does it every time we bring up that. Yeah, like, it's, uh, it's the trolling me. Thanks, on. thanks. It's okay. Mate. We know you're a nice person. Yeah. yeah. No, we don't. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, the anti-democratic feeling about it. It's just like, uh, I, like I said, we both voted Remain, and I was talking to a comedian friend of mine, and, and his wife we were having dinner, and I said, you know what? If there's a second referendum now. I would vote to leave because we had a vote and we have to respect mm. people's vote. Otherwise, you're going to have you're going to have trouble on the streets. Otherwise, in my mm. opinion, right? And they looked at me like I just said that sacrificing babies <laughs> is the best government policy, yeah. and Theresa May should adopt it immediately. Mm. And I and I just don't understand how these people think. It's like you had a democratic vote, you lost, and when that happens, you accept it and move on. That's democracy. If yeah. you don't accept the result of a vote, that's what we do in Russia. Mm. Or we do in Ukraine, or we do in Azerbaijan, or whatever. Which countries which don't have democracy. So that, it's amazing to me that yeah. the people are in this position now where it's like, well, who gives a shit what the vote was? We'll just do what we want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, uh, I mean, I, I was amazed that after the referendum, people who um, were not particularly political or knowledgeable about the EU suddenly developing this all consuming love for the EU <laughs> yeah. and talking about it in terms of, you know, it's, you know, the, the that it was this kind of vehicle of, of peace and prosperity and full employment across the whole, you know, it's almost like they didn't even realize that, you know, Greece and Italy and mm. Spain, you know, all these countries are really suffering in the Eurozone and that it's been deeply anti-democratic, um, that it has, I would argue, has undermined workers' rights in many of these countries. You know, there is a, in this country, there used to be quite a strong left-wing tradition against the EU because mm. it was seen as anti-democratic. This was a sort of Tony Benn, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn yeah. worldview. <laughs> and I th Britain is very unusual and it's probably the only country in Europe that doesn't have still a strong left-wing opposition to the EU. Um, and, you know, my, my views on the EU, you know, like most of my views are not kind of easily packaged into left or right. I, you know, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I'd call myself a liberal. But I have a very strong view that, you know, people's votes should count. And I would have thought that that was a fairly natural, obvious point for you know most people somewhere in the middle, mm. on the left and the right, that no, that should be wrong. a kind of given. <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, it's amazing how many people think that you know, and, and and believe that if you have a second referendum, that all that other stuff will just go away, mm. that people's views on the EU will just dissipate, they'll give up, and then we'll be back to normal and everything can carry on. You know, the genie's out of the bottle. You have to understand why people voted that way, and. You know, I, I think, you know, if, we're, if, if, if people were more intellectually honest, they would look at it and say, well, you know, maybe our worldview it does not encompass the full range, doesn't recognise that the EU has not been an unalloyed good for everybody in this country. And uh, one of the things that I'm interested in, um, in the research that I've done about multiculturalism, is the importance of 
culture in creating um, connections between people and the sense of solidarity. And I thought when people talked about Leave voters and people outside London after the referendum, you could see that there was no sense of solidarity with any of those people. Mm. And they would, I, I remember having a conversation with someone who just said, well, you know, these people, they don't even work. You know, he, what, you know, he was angry because he felt, you know, these are pensioners, the, you know, um, uh, people who are unemployed, mm. who are on, you know, welfare, and therefore they're not my people. And I, it's depressing because if a, you know, if a country is to survive and to be cohesive, it needs to have a sense of solidarity despite your differences. Mm. And, and, and you know, maybe that's, the, you know, that, that's something we have to start looking at. You know, how do we build that sense that your interests, what, what happens to you in your life, you know, if you suffer, that's my, that's my responsibility too. And that, you know, that's where the welfare state came from in a way. It's this idea that we're all, we are all in it together. You know, we have to look after each other a bit. And we can have disagreements within that context, but there has to be kind of basic recognition that you know, these, these people are our people. We have to look after them. Absolutely. Listen, it's been an absolutely brilliant interview. Thank you so much for coming on. Two questions before we let you yeah. go. Uh, one thing I just remembered, we had Chloe Wesley on a couple of weeks ago uh, who said that we shouldn't have any public funding of art because it's a waste of money. And I, I thought you might be slightly triggered by that and I wanted to <laughs> I give you triggered. an opportunity <laughs> to respond. Well, I respect Chloe very much. I think she's, you know, she makes lots of good points. And, um, but on this, I, I, I disagree because I, I think that... Um, you know, there are times when the state does fund institutions and it funds things which the market is not particularly good at funding. You know, I don't believe that the market is always the best arbiter of truth or judgment. And in the arts and in culture, um, you know, what's popular is not always what's good. And we have to, I think it's good to create other types of funding, other kinds of disinterested funding. Um, it's one of the reasons why I do believe in a publicly funded health system. I mean, we could have a conversation about how the NHS works and um, a degree of marketization. I like the mixed model because mm. I think it's, there's a certain check and balance mm. about how funding works. So in the arts, I, you know, and there are certain types of institutions, certain types of art, which um, would just you know, wither, I think, without market fund, if it was just relying on the market for funding. Um, I have a vested interest, I'm on the board of arts organisations, so I, you, know, you could say that I'm conflicted, but um, you know, it's not a huge amount of money, but it's about um, protecting something which is important to a civilization as well. And particularly in areas like heritage, where it's just expensive and it is really hard to sustain some of our great heritage assets through, you know, um, private donations mm. and, and ticket prices. And, you know, we, we owe it, we're responsible for, you know, looking after our past and, as well as our present. So that's my answer on that. Brilliant. Do you want to do the last question? Uh, yes. Uh, so um, the last question we always do. Incidentally, I did not everything popular is good. That's a Justin Bieber argument. That is the... Uh that's the way, not everything popular is good. But um, the Great way... Great man, profound thinker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the last question we always ask is... What Justin, is... not you. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're neither, mate. Yeah, I know, so I, know, I, I know. We're both neither. Um, what is the thing that we're not talking about in society that we really should be, in your opinion? Um, uh, well, this might sound a bit left field, but there is a reason why. When I was looking at Stop and Search and I was looking at... Um, uh, the, the disproportionate number of BME men in the prison system. I was thinking a lot about why that is, and essentially I think a lot of that has to do with the, the drugs industry. It is an industry in this country. It's an unregulated, unpoliced industry, um, and drug legalisation. And I, I don't have... Um, I haven't got a strident view on either side about whether we should have legalisation or not. But I think it's one of those issues where politicians run a mile from it because it's very, very contentious. They think they'll lose votes, and it's a very difficult argument to have. Um, but I think we need to have it. It's, it you know, clearly something is not working. We have, um, we have criminal gangs in this country who target vulnerable groups, particularly amongst the black community. And a number of those very young people are dying. They're being injured. And it is because they are, you know, they are foot soldiers in a bigger war. And, um, I, you know, I think the idea that you can just kind of... And, you know, and people take drugs recreationally and they enjoy it and that's not going to stop. So something's got to give. And, you know, if policymakers and politicians could look at it honestly and rigorously, we might have a different conversation about it. And that, I think, would be a healthy thing. So it's a slightly left-field 
No, it was brilliant. So, we, we keep trying to get a few yeah. people on to talk about drug decriminalization. I think it's a really important conversation mm. with so many different repercussions. I used you know. to work in Newham and the, the children that were involved were mm. 10 and 11 years old. And there'd be children who you lived in Newham and then all of a sudden they turned up in Aberdeen. Mm. What are they doing in Aberdeen? Obviously, they were yeah. just runners. Yeah. And it's tragic. Yeah. Absolutely heartbreaking. Good note to end the show on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just a bit of tragedy from yeah. Francis. Alyssa Minera, thank you so much for coming thank on. You. It's brilliant. I enjoyed it. yeah. you, your blog, just to remind everybody again, is allinbritain.org. Allinbritain.org. Yeah. Are you on Twitter or other social media? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, the Twitter handle is just at All in Britain. At All in Britain, perfect. It's and a you, Facebook page and there's Instagram. Yeah. And yeah. You yourself, do you have a, a Twitter account yourself? I don't. I'm not on Twitter. Wow. Um, wow. I don't. <laughs> jealous. Jealous. I don't tweet. You don't yeah, tweet. No, That's no. why you're happy. Yeah. Well done. You're not on social <laughs> not media. Why. Yeah. Why. Uh, well, we are on social media, so as always, follow us at TriggerPod. As you will know by now, we have a Patreon account as well, at TriggerPod as well. Uh, we've got a bunch of people already who are uh, subscribers on that, so follow us on that. Uh, subscribe to us, and we will see you when we see you. As you know, season one of Trigonometry is, is now over. This has been the bonus episode for you. As you've seen, we're on location with helicopters and all the bells and whistles yep. uh, that you can expect. Uh, um, and so thanks. this is the last time you'll see Constantine. Sadly. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm being taken away uh, and shot. Um, which will make Francis incredibly happy. So uh, that's been it. We will be back very soon with a bunch of other content for you. We'll keep you posted, especially if you're a patron. Um, uh, patron. We will keep putting out little bits of information. Uh, but thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you very soon. Bye.